Good morning, champions. Welcome to the assembly of the God begotten. Hope you had a blessed week. I had a beautiful week full of discoveries. Probably I'll share one with you. We are still on our series on begotten of love. As I reflected on what could possibly be our best summary for our last session, the, the scripture in Jeremiah chapter 23, chapter 9, verse 23 to 24 came to my heart. And as a summary for the last session, so we can run on, because we're going to be building on that. I'll just read that place. Say, so let not the one who is wise and skillful boast in his insight. And let not the one who is mighty and powerful boast in his strength. Let not the one who is rich boast in his temporal satisfaction and earthly abundance. But let the one who boasts, boast in this, that he understands and knows me and acknowledges me and honors me as God and recognizes without any doubt that I am the Lord who practices loving kindness, justice and righteousness on the earth. For in these things I delight, says the Lord. That perfectly captures what we did last time, that love does not parade itself. The only place where boasting is appropriate is when it's about God. Love is about our relationship, our relationship with God, our relationship with each other. And the only place that you are allowed to boast freely is when, as a witness of God, you stand back and admire him and talk about his greatness and talk about his might and talk about his power. Hallelujah. Today we quickly go back to the scriptures we've been holding and running this week. 1 John 4, 7. I won't read that one today. I will introduce a new scripture because we're going to add up and run from next week. Ephesians 5, 1 and 2. I'll just read that one. And then of course, 1 Corinthians 13, 4 gives us our explanation. It says, imitate God. I read from the New Living Translation. Therefore, in everything you do. Because you are his dear children, we are talking about begotten, imitate God, live a life filled with love, following the example of Christ. He loved us and offered himself as a sacrifice for us, a pleasing aroma to God. And of course, 1 Corinthians chapter 13 verse 4, where we have been at, says this love suffers long and is kind. This love is not envious. This love does not parade itself, and this love is not puffed up. Today's focus, that's actually our our main focus for today, love is not puffed up. Turn to somebody, sit it close to you and say to that person, neighbor, say the way I'm saying it, neighbor, thank God, I am begotten of God, not the puffer fish. Say to the next person, neighbor, thank God, I am begotten of God, not the puffer fish. Thank God. Do you know that there is enough poison in one fish, one puffer fish, to kill about 30 adult human beings? And there is no known antidote. Now, if this is just one fish that can kill 30 adult human beings, Imagine the number of lives and destinies that our pride and arrogance destroys. Today we're looking at Paul talking about love not being puffed up. To be puffed up is to be arrogant, prideful, conceited, self-inflated, self-important, self-exalted, bloated, swollen up, haughty. You just feel everywhere. Think of a balloon. Or think of my puffer fish. It is subtle self-exaltation and presumptuous superiority. Who they? You are the only one. Or we are the only one. That manifests itself in the disdainful way we treat other people. Just like envy and jealousy, which are two sides of the coin called covetousness. Parading oneself, what we did the last time, and puffing up are two sides of one coin called pride. While parading is about our outward appearance, outward displays of self-importance and how people see us, being puffed up is about how our inner attitude, how we see, how we feel about ourselves. Both of these things are rooted in pride, 
in identity issues, in security, in envy. Now, we'll quickly look into our puffy mirror. Because sometimes we can look at these things and just think about it like, I'm not puffed up, that's not me. I've been a Christian for 60 years now. I've come a long way. The thing about even being puffed up is that you can be puffed up about very foolish things. Like the Corinthian church that were puffed up about having a man in their midst who was flagrantly having sexual relationships with his stepmother. So you can be proud about very foolish things. But let's look into our, our puffy, puffy mirror. If you pitch Paul against Apollos, you know, if you, if you are so puffed up with the idea that you sit under Paul and begin to pitch Paul's revelation, Paul's gift, Paul's learning, and Paul's eloquence against Apollos, you are being unfair to both men, robbing yourself of the blessings of both men and dishonoring the God who called both men. Because sometimes we can be so puffed up that we're sitting under one spiritual leader. Our spiritual leader has all the, all the revelations. And if he's not the one preaching something, that's not the truth. That's not the Bible. That's not it. If as a leader, this one was my discovery of the century. If as a leader, you are ignoring or avoiding you know, tolerating or accommodating something you should be addressing head on because of your humility or because you think it is unloving to do so. Paul says, you and I, it's a problem I have, you and I are actually puffed up. It's a, it's, you have a pride problem. So you are in a place and there's something happening that shouldn't be happening. You're the leader there. And because you're being loving or maybe you are being humble, you don't talk about it. You don't, you don't address it head on. You find a way of rotating around it. Paul says, you are not humble. You have a pride problem. It is easy to even be puffed up over our own opinion. So if you believe your opinion is the right one on any given matter, and every other person's own is wrong, if you pretend to be an expert on something you know nothing about, if you tend to believe that your opinions are always right, and you are unwilling to consider any contrary opinion from others. If you find yourself being condescending, smug, or mean to other people who don't agree with you. If you believe that others are beneath you. You may not actually put it that way, but you act like that way. If you know it all, that beyond what you know, there is absolutely nothing to be known. And sometimes when you don't know it, people can't tell you. Paul says you have a problem called puffed up. And in 1 Corinthians, I think 8, 1 and 2, he added that knowledge puffed up, but love edified. So if anyone thinks of himself as a know-it-all, he still has a lot to learn. Now, if it is hard for you to own up to your own mistakes, we can be puffed up over taking responsibilities. It's so hard for you to own up to your own mistakes or take responsibility for your poor behavior. I mean, you are too, you're so, we are so important that we cannot make mistakes. That can't, couldn't have come from me. If it is easy to blame other people other than your infallible self, if you throw a fit whenever someone contradicts you, or you visibly become swollen up when someone corrects you, or whenever a situation reveals your inadequacies and need for growth, if you don't want to hear any other feedback except one that is positive, if your abilities, if you feel your abilities or accomplishments are somehow dramatically better than others, Paul says, you have a puffed up problem. If you're so fixated on titles and positions that you find it difficult to sincerely serve or be in a lower position while others lead, of course, you could do a better job or you are better qualified, better suited for it, if you are more concerned with recognition than in getting the job done, you have a name. If you are not at peace with who you truly are and need to hide behind an invented, bloated version of you if, you, if you, if you like being right, if you love the feeling of being in control, and when someone doesn't behave or act in a way you want, you become offended, if you are desperate for attention and find yourself unable to say no to people because you need to be needed. If your interactions revolve around trying to prove to others that you are superior. If some part of you, some part of you somewhere, think you can treat anybody anyhow and get away 
with whatever you want and get your way anyhow, your sense of entitlement is part of what call, um, Paul, Paul calls puffed up. If you feel the need to be better than everyone else, so you often find yourself easily finding fault on, with other people, belittling their struggles and putting them down consciously or unconsciously. If you lower people in order to raise yourself, if you are an expert at fixing people where they belong, God help us. If you judge and criticize people to reveal their low estate, if you use people to feel better about yourself, Paul says, you have a problem called puffed up. Now, because these are issues of the heart and we are all so different, this, my puffy mirror, is by no means exhaustive. What I prayed for the Holy Spirit, I prayed to the Holy Spirit, that if you listen, he will begin to shine light in our heart and x-ray those things we did not actually know, that these were the things that were eating at our love at our love life and taking away love from our rank because there are certain realms of glory that dimensions of power that you and I will not access until we begin to walk in love. So if love isn't puffed up, if love isn't feeling itself, is not arrogant, what is love doing? Love isn't puffed up because love is busy building up. Love builds up lives. Love builds up churches. Love builds up corporations. Love builds up families. So how do we escape this puff of problem if this is where we find ourselves? Romans 12.10 brings us the help we need. He said, give preference to one another, meaning treat other people, respect other people, give more honor, honor to others than you want for yourself, and ultimately surrender your heart to the Holy Spirit because you cannot sincerely do this thing on your own. Love is the first fruit of the Spirit. The easiest way to live this life is to walk in the spirit. When you walk in the spirit, you will not fulfill the desires of the flesh. And love is the first fruit of the spirit. I'll leave you with a picture of Jesus wrapped in a towel, washing his disciples' feet. Let this be our greatest example, our greatest model, our greatest instructor in this matter. This was love himself dressed in humility. The king of kings wrapped in, an apron, in a servant's apron. Jesus had everything to puff up about, everything to, be, to vaunt about. He was Jesus, or he is Jesus. The heir of all things, son of God, savior of the world, yet he laid aside his garment. We may think that was an outward garment, but that was Jesus laying aside his glory, his majesty, his wealth, his wisdom, his omnipotence, his, his omnipresence, his omniscience, and wrapping himself with a towel. His love kept him focused on God and on us. The love of God in us is supposed to keep us focused on God and on others. May we, as we rise to make our confession this morning, have one prayer in our heart and desire that this, the attitude that Christ had had, the same mind that had been in Christ Jesus, will be the mind that is found in us. Please, let's rise and let's affirm the word of God together this morning. You and I have been com commanded to imitate God. And as we imitate him, we will see power break out in our lives. Say this with me. I am called to imitate God. Say it like you mean it. I'm called to imitate God and walk in love. I am filled with the thoughts of God. I am filled with the word of God. I am filled with the deeds of God. I am filled with the character of God. I am not filled with pride and inflated with arrogance. I live a life filled with love, following the example of Christ. I am a reflection of the love of Jesus to my world. I am not self-sufficient. My sufficiency is of God. I owe no man nothing except to love and seek the best for him. I walk in self-sacrificing love towards other people. I am not obsessed with getting my own advantage. I am called to imitate Christ in humility and use my freedom 
in the service of others. I will be a faithful envoy of God's love in my sphere. I am begotten of God. His nature of love is born in me. I choose to die to envy, pride and arrogance. I die to insecurity, self-comparison and ingratitude. I refuse to allow self-exaltation to hide in my heart. I refuse to take credit for what God does. Henceforth, I do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. I will put others first and view them as more important than myself. I boast in Christ Jesus and have no confidence in the flesh. My true confidence flows from God's empowering presence. Say this one like you mean it. God's love lives and flourishes in me. Raise your voice and keep saying that the love of God lives and flourishes in me. The love of God lives and flourishes in me. Say it like David. Search my heart, O Lord, and see if there is any evil way in me. Lead me in the paths of righteousness. Cause my love to abound more and more. Cause my love to overflow in sound wisdom and judgment. Cause me to walk daily in love. Say, Lord, help me to love like you do. Help me to see men like you do. Help me to treat people like you do. Help me to watch what you do and do the same. May I, at the end of time, be one who had imitated you as a beloved child of yours, Father. In the name of Jesus.